second study period at the British Columbian Camp 1983 and this is the 11 o'clock study on Wednesday morning. Now after our last study period closed a question was raised in regard to how do we gain an individual experience in knowing the will of God. Well this begins of course by the making of a very firm covenant with God. In other, in other words having come to recognize the principles of holiness being obedience and faith and knowing of course that we don't act at our own impulses but we obey the commands of God and do what he says to do we make a very solemn covenant with God and we say Lord from this time on I accept you as my problem solver my um, plan maker and my burden bearer you are my commander, you are my leader and you are my head and I'm, I'm a member who receives instructions from you day by day and I dedicate myself to live a holy life, a life of obeying your commandments and trusting in your promises. So having made the general covenant with God, then every single morning make, make it your very first wish to consecrate yourself to God for that day and to renew that covenant every single morning. And when you come to a specific, uh, and of course day by day you carry on your duties, remember the, the, the voice of duty is the voice of God, isn't it? We're told that somewhere in the spirit of prophecy. So if you're a housewife and you have the task of keeping a home day by day, that's your orders, that's, that's, that's what God commands you to do. And you do that day after day after day until some such time comes as a problem or difficulty or new responsibility is to be added to your life. Now when you find yourself facing a specific problem which requires a specific solution then you, 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 you're very careful first of all to make sure that you do not start thinking up different possibilities by way of solutions. Keep your mind completely empty so there's nothing, there's no other voice that crowds out the voice of God. And remember I read to you from page 363 in the book Desire of Ages the other day where, where the, the statement which says when every other voice is hushed and that means those other plans, those other ideas, those other schemes that would uh, intrude and drown out the voice of God and if you find that you have, <coughs> have in your mind certain plans or expectations get, get in upon your knees and ask God to empty your mind of those things and he certainly will, he most certainly will do that then, um, then when, once that is done, kneel down and present God with the problem, spelling it out in your prayer and telling God exactly what that problem is in detail. Tell it to him. And he already knows, of course. But the act of telling him does something in the way of clearing your mind of the problem. It's, it's, a, it's a very important step in the actual handing over of that problem. And when you told God what the problem is and hand it to him, literally give it to him, I said, now Lord, you've got it and I will now simply await your directives to do or not to do as the case may be. Now, one of two things is going to happen at this point. One is that a plan will form in your own mind. It'll, it, it won't come from your logic or your thinking. It'll just form there. And if it does, that plan must be recognized as possibly coming from God or coming from Satan, one or the other. One or the other. Now, in order to safeguard yourself from being deceived by Satan, you must then give that plan back to God to be given up or carried through as his providence shall indicate. And if the plan is from God, it will move through and be successfully carried out. If it's from Satan, of course, and God has it, it will die a natural death. <clears throat> so then, you then proceed with the plan, as I said, and if it doesn't work out, then you go back to your knees again and say, Lord, now what do I do? The plan didn't work out. Now, on the other hand, you may give God the problem and nothing at all may happen. You may get no, no orders, no plan, no anything. Now, if that's the case, don't feel that God hasn't heard your prayer. It just means he's not going to use you to help solve the problem. I'll give you an example of this kind of situation. As you will remember, the time came when Achis, the king of the Philistines, set out to make war with Israel against King Saul and his armies. And uh, he made it very clear that um, he expected David to go down and fight with him against his own countrymen. And that's something, of course, David just could not do under any circumstances. Under any circumstances. But at the same time, 
because of his um, activities and his representations to King Achish, he couldn't say, well, look, I can't do it, because he'd given the king the impression he would do it. So David had a very real problem, which he took to God in prayer and left it with the Lord, and the Lord never said anything to David whatsoever. He gave him no, no message, no indication, nothing. Just left him in total ignorance to go on down toward the land of Israel over the next several days of marching, but God was a very busy person in the meantime, and the angels were sent to the lords of the Philistines, who were uh, reminded by the angels of the peril of David's presence and called upon by um, by those angels and, and, and the lords of the Philistines became more and more concerned until finally they um, they went to King Achish and forced him to send David back home again and the first thing David knew about any solutions to the problem was when the king called him and said okay the lords of the Philistines favour you not you must go back to your own city Ziklag once more and he left and went back so there was a case, of course, where um, uh, God did not give any indication of solution to the person involved until the time for the solution came to be worked out. So it'll come to you, one or two things will happen. God will either give you a plan uh, or he'll give you nothing. And either way, we know what to do, right? Now, I can't overstress the point, of course, that you need to maintain a daily communion with God. Always spend some time in the morning on your knees studying God's word and uh, reconsecrating yourself to God for that day there's a very fine statement in the steps to Christ uh, which has always been a great help to me in this connection just here in fine I think this has got uh, different page in this edition I'll soon find out it does too so I might have great trouble finding it but the statement says uh, consecrate yourself to God in the morning make this your very first work <laughs> surrender all your plans to him to be given up or carried through as his providence shall indicate and as I said this book has got the wrong paging so I have a great trouble in finding it in this particular volume but uh, anyway, you know, I know you can find it it's in the chapter I think Growing Up Into Christ and uh, I'll soon tell this one looks a bit of a fine no this is the right paging definitely Okay, let me see if I can find the uh, statement now and give you the right page for it. It's on page 70 in this edition. And this edition does have the right paging. Yes, it does have the right paging. It's page 70. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at your feet. Use me today in your service. Abide with me and let my work be wrought in you. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. Thus day by day you may be giving your life into the hands of God and thus your life will be moulded more and more after the life of Christ. Now those parents uh, who have little children and who have accepted the message on the removal of the disposition or the spirit of disobedience should realize of course that they need to gather their children every morning and make that very special consecration of the child to God for that day that the spirit of God will fill that child's life and strengthen the spirit of obedience so that throughout the day there will be good relationships between parents and children at the end of every day of course likewise have a little thanksgiving service and consecrate the life again for the night now I think in the book entitled Sabbath Rest God's Sabbath Rest you find the principles I have just talked about outlined in the chapter entitled In Practical Terms I think I have to check it and see <clears throat> now let's move on now with the, with the story of Christ and that doesn't quite answer the question asked me get it into the study period and we'll give it some more time and um, and um, consideration now to page 119 in the book Desire of Ages and we'll notice now something of the issue that was being fought out in this controversy on the mountain and let me stress again that Jesus Christ gained the victory not by doing something but by doing what? Nothing, Nothing. Yeah. in action and that's the toughest kind of victory for a human being to gain isn't it? That's to do nothing when there's tremendous pressure upon you and when men and women all around you are crying out if, of course there are no men and women there but in normal situations you find that men and women say do something, please do something that's the cry that rings out 
and sometimes of course doing something is very necessary but in this kind of struggle doing nothing was the pathway to victory that is doing nothing of what Satan demanded of course Christ did do something in this respect he maintained a very very earnest prayer life during this period he did do that so it wasn't entirely inactive but there was no doing anything in the form of solutions so page 119 the words from heaven this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased Matthew 3 verse 17 were still sounding in the ears of Satan but he was determined to make Christ disbelieve this testimony the word of God was Christ's assurance of his divine mission he had come to live as a man among men and it was the word that declared his connection with heaven it was Satan's purpose to cause him to doubt that word and note this next sentence or two if Christ's confidence in God could be shaken Satan knew that the victory in the whole controversy would be his he could overcome Jesus he hoped that under the force of despondency and extreme hunger Christ would lose faith in his father now note the next words and work a miracle in his own behalf or do something right now had he done this the plan of salvation would have been broken right if he'd done that the plan of salvation would have been broken now we have to learn today that as Christ fought a very critical battle on that matter of temptation and throughout the remaining years of his life upon this earth so we as the Philadelphian church the fifth angels movement and therefore the 144,000 we are to be God's instruments during the loud cry period and the time of Jacob's trouble to fight and win a battle which must be won as impeccably and flawlessly as Christ won the battle back there if the dead in their graves are to be raised from their graves now we learn about the law of the first fruits in our studies of the seven angels movements a year or two back <clears throat> I'm saying these comments now on the supposition of course that you remember those studies on the seven angels and you learnt there that the law of the first fruit is that no harvest can be gathered until the first fruits have been offered right no harvest till the first fruits have been offered now in Revelation chapter 14 <clears throat> we have a picture given to us of Jesus Christ coming down to the clouds of heaven he has left he has left the the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary let's just draw the temple up there he's on the great white cloud and on that great white cloud he carries a sickle in his hands and when a person carries a sickle in his hand a reaper then how do you identify that person in other words if you see a person walking around with a book of airways maps under his arm what do you say he is he's a pilot if you see a person with a hammer and sword what do you say he is he's a carpenter if you see a person with a sickle what do you say he is a reaper. a reaper or a harvester right so Jesus Christ then comes down to the clouds of heaven as the harvester but as he comes then down upon the earth there's a company of people whom the Bible calls in Revelation 14 verse 4 they are the 144,000 they're called by that name in Revelation chapter 14 1 to 4 and they're also called the first fruits okay they're called that in Revelation chapter uh, 14 now in the Old Testament symbolism and as verified of course in the book Desire of Ages the law was that, that the harvest could not be gathered until the first fruits had, had, had done their work right that's the law so therefore the Philadelphian church during the final time of struggle when God's character must be fully and finally revealed and vindicated have a work to perform and that company of people have to succeed as Christ succeeded and they have to succeed where every other church in history has failed now what has been the failing point of every other church in history the failing point has been that when they came under pressure <clears throat> instead of doing nothing they lost faith in God they had more faith in themselves and they turned aside from God's specific orders to work a work which in their opinion would save the church and guarantee its prosperity that is the point where the church has always failed do you see that uh, that's the point now did Christ fail at that point no he didn't 
He was a perfect example. He simply asked the question, what are my orders? That's all he asked. And the orders were that to, to, uh, to leave God to vindicate him, to leave God to prove him, and to wait till God gave him food. He said, right, I shall obey those orders, no matter what the cost may be. And even if the work of God fails, even if I don't survive, even if God has forsaken his post of duty, I will still obey my orders. And by doing nothing, by standing still, Christ gained the victory. And how shall we gain the victory during Jacob's trouble? Same way. Same way. By doing nothing when the pressure is upon us to do something. And that paragraph on page 119, in respect to the Philadelphian Church's responsibilities and experience, is a very, very vital paragraph indeed. Note that last sentence again. Satan hoped that under the, the force of despondency and extreme hunger, Christ would lose faith in his Father and work a miracle on his own behalf. Had he done this, the plan of salvation would have been broken and there could never have been any harvest of souls from the grave in consequence. And likewise, if we, during Jacob's trouble, turn aside from patiently leaving God to do his work, then once again the plan of salvation will be frustrated and the great harvest cannot be gathered. <clears throat> and that's why the, the fifth angel of movement will say, they'll say to Jesus Christ, you are the harvester you thrust in your sharp sickle and you do the reaping because we're not going to do it it's not our job it's your job and no amount of pressure will induce us to forget our orders and take over your work now move across to page 121 now to further develop this principle of resting in the orders of God and to recognize that God does permit suffering to come upon his people in order to teach them that survival is less important than obedience. <clears throat> so page 121, I'll read these words. When Christ said to the tempter, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, he spoke the words that more than 1,400 years before he had spoken to Israel. Let's turn back to those words in the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 2 and 3. I'd like to have you read them directly from your own Bibles. So we have the context of the original statement made by Jesus Christ himself through Moses, the leader of Israel at that time. Well, the leader, of course, and the God, the real leader. The 8th chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 2 and 3. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Now, what is prolonged hunger a threat to? Life, Life or survival, right? Life or survival. I like the word survival, I think, because it indicates uh, the, con the continuation of life in this respect. Now, the Lord suffered them to hunger, or the Lord allowed their survival to be threatened, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Now, the words in that verse which say that he might make thee know, can you give me a, one word that covers that make thee know? Teach. teach. Right, that's the word. That he might teach you. He might educate you. He might instruct you to understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, bread, of course, is a means of survival. It's a means of living. And what was God saying in effect? I want you to understand that survival is not so important as obedience, right? That's the lesson God desired to teach them. Now, if we come back to Desire of Ages, page 121, we'll find that that is the lesson which Christ demonstrated in the desert and demonstrated to perfection. So we read again, in the wilderness, we're halfway down the paragraph now, of course, when all means of sustenance failed, God sent his people manna from heaven and a sufficient and constant supply was given. This provision was to teach them that while they trusted in God and walked in his ways, he would not forsake them. All right, now, let's look at that sentence now and put it again in other words. 
this provision was to teach them that while they trusted in God, now one word for that, trusted in God? No, no, that was faith. That's faith. And walked in His ways, what's that? That's obedience. So then when, let's, let's rewrite the sentence again then, in different words again, in, um, we'll find the place again, right. That while they lived a, what? Holy, Holy life. Okay. Are those three things the same? We will now state the sentence three different times, or three different ways. This provision was a teach them that while they trusted in God and walked in His ways. That's one way. The next way is, this provision was to teach them that while they believed and obeyed. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Now thirdly, this provision was to teach them that while they lived a holy life. Same thing, right? He would not forsake them. Now, did Israel ever really go hungry back in the desert? Yeah. Did they have to fast for days and days and days and days? Yeah. No. Yeah. Now, of course, remember, at the moment they, have, the moment they missed a single meal, what did they start to do? Yeah. They murmured. In other words, they refused to be taught the lesson properly, didn't they? In other words, if they had been prepared to learn the lesson, God would have kept them hungry for a few days probably in order to reinforce the lesson, but they never gave them the opportunity. In other words, they fought against God exactly as Jacob did by the book Jabbok. They refused to accept the lesson. They could, they could not uh, submit to being taught. And because they would not submit to being taught, they never went hungry for very long. Maybe, maybe they missed one meal, perhaps. And therefore, they never really learned the lessons they ought to have learned. They never grew strong in the Lord. And when the testing time came, they failed miserably and desperately and consequently not one of them ever really entered the promised land apart from Caleb and Joshua and some of the Levites but Jesus did learn that lesson I now read um, the Saviour now practiced the lesson he had taught to Israel by the word of God succor had been given to the Hebrew host and by the same word it, it would be given to Jesus and note this next beautiful sentence he awaited God's time to bring relief that Israel never did. When they grew hungry, what did they say? We want food when? Right. Now. We're waiting, we won't wait. We want it now. Feed us or else we don't believe in you. But Christ waited God's time to bring relief. He was in the wilderness in obedience to God. Let right, me stop right there. Now let's rewrite that sentence. Not to change not to change the words, of course, but to give us a different a better understanding of it. He was in the wilderness and obedience to God. Now, shall I say he knew his orders? Right? Same thing, isn't it? He knew his orders. And he would not obtain food by following the suggestions of Satan. In the presence of the witnessing universe, he testified that it is a less calamity to suffer whatever may befall than to depart in any manner from the will of God. Now, let's think of some of the things that might befall. Now, when, for instance, we are brought in the straight places, such as the apostles were in that lake that night, and that fearful storm overtook them, then was their survival threatened? Mm -hmm. right? Death could have befallen them, couldn't it? They could have perished that night. Mm -hmm. And when God sends us into dangerous places, then likewise our security is threatened and we are in great danger. But we are to take the stand that no matter what may befall calamity though it be and certainly starvation or death is a calamity but that's less a calamity than, than to depart in any manner from the will of God now during the year I almost forgot to mention this point too but during the year a very very practical and valuable lesson came home to me and also to Andreas Dura who is the worker in Europe at the present time and from time to time he has to go into very dangerous places around the earth such as Romania, Czechoslovakia, East Germany where the communist rule is supreme and um, we know of course from events of the, over the past week or two how ruthless and bloodthirsty those people can be. And of course no doubt he goes in those places with a certain level of fear and I would not myself be very comfortable going into those places if I had to which I don't fortunately I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I fear anyway anyway um, I was meditating upon the life story of Moses in Egypt um, when all of a sudden it was, in, it was in a Sabbath school lesson I think yes in a Sabbath school lesson somewhere when I was visiting amongst our believers 
when all of a sudden I saw something which I'd never seen before. There's something really amazing about the story of Moses going in and out of Pharaoh's presence day by day. Do you, do you realize what it is? He has the protection. But why should he need special protection? Because of who he was. And who was he? He was a wanted murderer. Mm -hmm. Wasn't he? Yeah, he ran away for his life. That's right. And when Moses ran for his life, he had been to that time number one in line for the throne of Egypt. And together with him had been number two, the other prince who gained the throne of Egypt during that period of time when Moses was out in Midian because the old Pharaoh died while Moses was away and his place was taken by number two to the throne who became number one of course when Moses fled. Now <clears throat> Mesopotamia or was it Midian where did he go? Was it Midian, Midian right it was to Midian. Midian of course is a long way from Egypt it's way up in the land up near the land of Palestine and um, Yes, it was Jacob who fled to Mesopotamia, and I, I somehow get those two places mixed up. But um, in Midian, Moses was, was beyond the reach of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh didn't care about him away up there. In fact, Pharaoh probably didn't even know where he was. Now, supposing, for instance, that one of us was to commit a murder in this country in Canada, and we fled, shall we say, to Cuba or to Russia, where we, where we were beyond the reach of uh, American and Canadian law. And we were there, shall we say, for a few years, and then God came and said, now you go back to America, and you go on television, you can become a public figure, and you preach the gospel throughout the length and breadth of America. You say, now wait a minute, Lord, just wait a minute. I can't obey those orders, because the moment I step back in American soil, the FBI will have me, and I'll be in prison immediately. How can I possibly preach to the multitudes and do your commands from prison? And I can imagine Moses saying now, just a minute, Lord, back there in Egypt, that Pharaoh on the throne knows me personally. He knows my voice. He knows my mannerisms. He knows what I look like. He knows everything about me. We, we, were, we, we slept in the same room once upon a time. We played together. We learned together. We, 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 we fought together. And everything in, in the Egyptian army. And the moment I go back there, Pharaoh's going to grab me and off comes my head. Straight away. But God said, go. And he went. He obeyed his orders. Now, the incredible thing is this, that, that when he got back there as a wanted murderer, he walked in and out of Pharaoh's presence day after day after day, and the king never lifted a finger to touch him. Now, isn't that amazing? It's incredible. And that's a story well worth remembering, because next time God gives you, gives you an order to do something dangerous, which eventually will come, and you're called upon to go into a place where Perhaps um, your life is threatened. Maybe you're asked to walk down the dark streets of New York or Brooklyn at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's dangerous. <laughs> that is dangerous. <laughs> I haven't tried it and I don't plan to. But if I get orders, I'll do it. <laughs> I've walked the dark streets of Los Angeles alone at night, down at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I've done it without fear too. So I'll do it in New York as well if the Lord, if the Lord calls me to do it. And uh, when, when that time comes, just take a deep breath and think of Moses, right? And when you remember what the incredible protection that Moses got at that point of time, then of course you'll have no fear. And that, that is a very amazing story, that Moses could do that at that point of time. And, and uh, it just demonstrates God does have the capacity to put the fear, or put a fear, upon the hearts of men in a situation like that. And that reminds me of the statement in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, which um, talks about the fear that God put upon the people that um, would otherwise have uh, re uh, worked a revenge upon poor Jacob. Page 206 in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, 206. The very first paragraph on the page which says, God caused a fear to rest upon the inhabitants of the land so that they made no attempt to avenge the slaughter of Shechem. The travellers reached Bethel unmolested. Here the Lord again appeared to Jacob and renewed to him the, the, the covenant promise. Now, as you may remember, of course, the, um, some of the sons of Jacob had tricked the Shechemites, who had come with very friendly overtures, and uh, taking advantage of this, of this uh, hand of friendship, the sons of Jacob had slaughtered the, um, the Shechemites in a very mean and, and beastly way, really. And it was so despicable. There was nothing fair, decent, honest, or just about the whole matter. And naturally, of course, the spirit of revenge being very strong in those people, they would never rest until the day came when they could wreak a revenge against the sons of Jacob. But 
God placed a fear upon those folk and therefore they didn't touch them. And we can be quite sure that we can walk unscathed to the most dangerous places upon the earth if we're there at God's command. And you will survive until your work is done. And stories like the story of, um, of Moses and the story of um, Jacob there are a very great vindication of that fact. But then if you think about it, come down to the work of Jesus Christ himself and Christ stepped out into a most perilous situation when he began his ministry. Let's take the Romans for starters. The Romans, the Romans were the occupying power and the Romans were very, very nervous and uh, watchful for possible insurrections. Now furthermore, they were quite familiar with the Jewish teaching that there was coming a Messiah and when this Messiah came, he'd be a Roman hater and he'd slay all the Romans and make Israel, I mean, yes, the Jews to be the, the great nations of the earth. So therefore, when the Romans, uh, when Jesus Christ began his ministry, the Romans would naturally regard these, these huge gatherings of people, five and six and ten thousand folk gathered together, as being a, des a very decided threat to their, uh, to their occupation. And... Um, You'd expect then that the Romans would have come and arrested Christ, but do you ever hear of a single attempt on the part of the Romans to ever arrest Christ? Not one. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? And then the Jews, of course, were extremely hostile to Christ's work and ministry, and they enjoyed the support of the Romans, at least to a certain extent. And yet, despite the fact that um, Christ went openly amongst them day after day after day, not a finger was raised to arrest him. That's an amazing fact when you think about it. An amazing fact. And the same with John the Baptist. And that reminds me, of course, of the statement that Christ made in quiet confidence to his nervous disciples when he proposed to go down to Bethany to effect the resurrection of Lazarus. And the text is quoted on page 5 to 7 of the book um, Desire of Ages. The reference you'll find somewhere in John, or Luke rather, 10 verses 38 to 42, or maybe in Luke uh, 11, 1 to 44. But I'll just read it as it's quoted here in Desire of Ages. And um, I'll start on page 5 to 6. After waiting for two days, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go into Judea again. The disciples questioned why, if Jesus was going to Judea, he waited two days. But anxiety for Christ and for themselves was now uppermost in their minds. Were they nervous? Apprehensive? They certainly were today, of course, to be, from, from, at least from the the, from, from the side of, uh, of circumstances they have caused to be yes. most decidedly but of course on the side of God's power they had no need to be nervous they could see nothing but danger in the course he was about to pursue master they said the Jews of late sought to stone thee and go stab thither again <laughs> Jesus answered are there are twelve hours in the day I am under the, under the guidance of my father in other words I am obeying my orders as long as I do his will, as long as I obey my orders, my life is safe. My twelve hours of day are not yet ended. I have entered upon the last remnants of my day, but while any of this remains, I am safe. And you are safe too. When you're carrying out God's orders, you're safe. God makes himself responsible for our protection moment by moment, so all you have to worry about is, am I under God's guidance? Am I carrying out his orders? Am I doing what I've been told to do? That's all you have to worry about. And that, that statement I, I love to quote again and again in previous camp meetings from the book uh, Great Controversy, which tells us that God's people have nothing to do with consequences. Remember that statement? Yes. Right. I'm going to read it again just the same. Because one of those statements that do bear a lot of uh, uh, repeating you just find it now it's 610 right 6, 9 to 10 right yeah right 609 to 610 the Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency who dare refuse to publish it he commands his servants to present the last invitation to mercy to the world they cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave results with God. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty. Now, this, we express those words. They must obey their orders 
and leave results with God. And don't forget the assurance given to us <coughs> 363 in the book Christ Topic Lessons which says that when we give ourselves wholly to God and in our work follow his directions or obey his orders he makes himself responsible for its accomplishment. Now Andreas recently made a trip into Romania and um, the, situation, the situation there is now such that he cannot go in by car because if he arrives at the border, at the border gates where they have the immigration um, places his name is blacklisted and he can't go in. Now, if you think getting into Canada was hard, you should try getting into <laughs> Romania. <laughs> they, they really set you through. But uh, he gets in there by joining, by going on a package tour, one of these, um, what, what they call them again, tourist um, trips, uh, a, planned, a planned tour. And he flies into the capital city where the believers are located goes to a hotel room where he stays until the trip is due to go back in about three weeks time and uh, then he goes out to visit the believers and comes back to his hotel room again and this way he has to avoid uh, coming out under the watchful eye of the secret police but he was only there one day and they knew all about it anyway <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the believers were called in and questioned by the secret police for many hours and then, let, and then released again and the secret police did nothing about Andreas till he was due to leave had about three to four days left when they called him in and spent about four hours questioning him and to his astonishment they found they had a, 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 a dossier that's why they have, they have a, a file on me personally would you believe it? <laughs> Amazing, I was, in, I was surprised yes to find it out I'd never been to a in my whole lifetime and yet they have a file there in which they... Um, they have details about the work we're doing, the kind of message we preach, the, the kind of camp meetings we conduct in Germany and the, the books we write. And it's not, it's not too detailed, Andreas said, but they do have information. I guess they're just waiting for one day I appear in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when, when he went back to his hotel room, he feared that he would never see the believers there again. But there came two very comforting thoughts, and one was that even if he didn't, the truth in their hearts would grow anyway and they would become stronger and stronger as the years went by. But also he began to realize that uh, when we are carrying out God's orders, our life is absolutely safe in God's hands. And curiously enough, he was not arrested. He was not, he was not ordered to stop preaching, although they said what he was doing was totally illegal in that country. But he said, don't you practice religious freedom? Oh yes, they said, but only with registered churches. If you're not a registered church, then you can't enjoy religious freedom. <laughs> And of course, we don't have a, a registered church system that um, uh, obeys government orders. In fact, I understand that the Seventh Adventist Church in Romania pays its tithe to the government. The government then selects the ministers and pays the ministers from that tithe. So it's a government-controlled church. And that's, that is something we'll never, ever accept in this movement, no matter what the cost may be. So those stories of Moses and Jacob, of Christ and John the Baptist and uh, Andreas in, uh, Eastern, East, in the Eastern Zone, all demonstrate that when God gives an order he does make himself responsible for our protection until the order is complete and therefore Christians can walk openly without fear they don't have to disguise themselves or creep, creep around down dark alleys they can walk openly in the streets with their heads held high as Moses did knowing that they're absolutely safe until their work is done and the darkest streets of Brooklyn and the deepest earliest hours of the morning would be no place for a Christian to fear if that's where God's sitting at that time of day. I wouldn't care. I'd just walk down the street openly and boldly and the muggers would stand by and let you go by. And they'd even say, good morning, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so truly we need to recognise, we need to have much more faith. We're too fearful of our survival, aren't we? We're too, we're too prone. I, I always was a timid soul, you know, so <laughs> I know what I'm talking about here. Very good. So let's, we can rejoice now in the wonderful victory which Jesus Christ gained in that first temptation. Let's go on to the second temptation now. Now I know in the past we've always spent a lot of time on the first temptation. It's, it's been a very productive field of study and we haven't paid much attention to, to temptation number two and temptation number three. So go back now to Matthew, the fourth chapter and uh, read the rather brief statement in regard to this it, 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 uh, it covers only 4, 5, 6 and 7 
before he entered the third temptation when Satan took him to the high mountain. So Matthew chapter 4 verses 5 through 7. And they, I'll be from verse that's right, 5. Then the devil taken him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now here we find that uh, Christ and Satan began to fight each other with the word of God. Is this an uncommon situation today? Do we find churches arguing about the scriptures? One church quoting one scripture, the other church quoting another scripture? Is this a common situation? Yeah. Sure it is. For, for example, in uh, Galatians 3.19, the Bible says, Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgression until the seed should come, and so on. And in about verse 24 in the same chapter says, The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and the women come to Christ when they're no longer under the schoolmaster. Now, that text, of course, is the one of the favourite texts used by those churches which no longer believe in the binding claims of God's law, and they, they use that, of course, to fight against the Adventists. And what do the Adventists use? Matthew chapter 5, which says that till heaven and earth pass, one, one jot and one tittle shall not in any wise pass, nor will all be fulfilled. And so one church group comes with one text, the other church group comes with the other text, and they fight each other with the word of God, just as Christ and Satan did on the mountaintop, right? Now we've learned, of course, in our experience, that we can take the text which the Protestant churches use, and the one which the Adventist church use, and see in them a beautiful and perfect harmony. We recognise that the Ten Commandments were added because of transgression, that they serve only, only until Christ the seed comes, that they are the schoolmaster which brings us to Jesus Christ, and that the real law of God, which is the real directive for our actions, is the beautiful life of Jesus Christ himself. He is the model, not the Ten Commandment law. Christ is the model, and we've learned to reconcile those two different principles. Now the reason why, of course, Satan now came as a Bible-quoting devil was because he had been defeated by a Bible-quoting saviour in the first temptation. So as we shall read in the next study period, time has virtually gone for this one, that uh, the Satan now came, supposing that he can meet Christ upon his own ground, and uh, literally asking God to commit an act of presumption. And Satan, as we shall see very clearly, of course, very seriously misquoted the word of God, when he said he should give his angels charge concerning he missed out a very vital part took the whole thing out of context and therefore destroyed the powerful and beautiful meaning which that text has for God's people now you just, just read a paragraph on uh, page 124 now to fill out the last few seconds Satan now supposes that he has met Jesus on his own ground the wily foe himself presents words that proceed from the mouth of God he still appears as an angel of light and he makes it evident that he is acquainted with the scriptures and understands the import of what is written. As Jesus before used the word of God to sustain his faith, the tempter now uses it to countenance his deception. He claims that he has been only testing the fidelity of Jesus and now commends his steadfastness. As the Saviour has manifested trust in God, Satan urges him to, still, to give still another evidence of his faith. What a deceptive foe. Right. Well, that's the end of our time, or about eight seconds. So, who'd like to ask any questions? If you have some. Does that mean that when we're taken to a place, so that Christ was taken up into the mountain there, Satan took him away? Mm -hmm. He never stopped from taking him away. So, you know, he let, him, he let himself be taken. Right. So, I guess in the same way, we would let ourselves be taken if someone wants to take us. If someone does it by force, yes. If we have a choice, well then naturally, of course, we decline to go if we don't have an order to go there. But if we're actually taken by force or tricked into going, I mean, you, you might... I've had situations where I have been invited to go to a certain situation and found an altogether different situation. When I got there, I've been tricked into going. Uh, when you find that under those circumstances you're tricked into going, then you can rely upon God to deliver you from that place, which you will do. Where in the Psalms do you find the verses? Matthew 1. 